किया जाए hmm. no, जी I think we can start now. Yes, you start with it. Okay. Namaskar. I, Dr. Aditya Khandewal, Executive Committee Member, Forty Women Win. Welcome you all to a webinar on the topic Pre-Packaged Insolvency Process. Federation of Rajasthan Trade and Industry is an apex chamber of trade and industry of the state of Rajasthan, and it is working since 1955. it is a registered body with the registrar of non trading companies and has over 2 lakh 2 lakh members it works under three verticals one is the uh, 40 main the second is the uh, 40 women's wing which was started almost 4 years back and the third wing is uh, 40 youth wing which started almost 3 years back 40 women wing was established for women determined to lead an independent and self sufficient life it has created a strong community of women who navigate through life obstacles and help each other grow in the process so now i invite mr suresh ji agarwal resident 40 to give a brief introduction of today's event namaskar namaskar anil ji abhishek mishra ji abhishek sharma ji aditi khandewal ji aap sabhi ka aaj ke is program mein hardik abhinandan swagat जैसे अदिति जी ने फोर्टी के बारे में बताया फोर्टी के नेशनल नहीं इंटरनेशनल ब्रांचेस भी कुछ है पांच ब्रांचेस इंटरनेशनल है और राजस्थान के हर डिस्ट्रिक्ट में इसकी ब्रांचेस है तो राजस्थान की गवर्नमेंट से हमारा इससे रेगुलर टाइप रहता है राजस्थान की गवर्नमेंट और व्यापारियों के बीच में एक बड़े सेतु का काम राजस्थान के लिए फोर्टी करती है इंटरनेशनल लेवल पे भी नेशनल लेवल पे भी जहाँ राजस्थान के लोगों को और किसी तरह की कोई प्रॉब्लम होती है उस समस्या को भी सरकार तक लेके जाने का काम फोर्टी करती है साथ ही साथ हमने पिछली बार और इस बार हालांकि सोशल फील्ड में फोर्टी बिल्कुल एक्टिव नहीं है फोर्टी वुमेन्स विंग और यूथ विंग काम करती है पर हमने कोरोना के दौरान अच्छा काम किया है जिसमें हमने एक सौ बेड का निशुल्क हॉस्पिटल जो अभी भी हमारा चल रहा है कोविड के लिए उसमें टोटल इलाज भी फ्री है और एक फाइव स्टार सुविधा के साथ हमने यहाँ पे खोला है एक अच्छा स्टार्टिंग थी और उसके दो यूनिट हमने अलग अलग जगह पे यहाँ से तकरीबन 100 किलोमीटर की दूरी पे सरकारी हॉस्पिटल में भी खोले हैं जो आज भी फुल है दोनों के दौरान भगवान करे जल्दी कोरोना ठीक हो हम सब स्वस्थ हो आप सबसे यही हमारी एक कामना है आज का जो विषय है इंसॉल्वेंसी एमएसएमई पे क्या फर्क है क्या इसका आने वाला है आप ज्यादा एक्सपर्ट है इसके बारे में आप ज्यादा बता पाएंगे पर राजस्थान एक ऐसा स्टेट है जो 90 परसेंट के तकरीबन एमएसएमई यूनिट है और इसका एक बड़ा बेनिफिट राजस्थान को मिलना चाहिए क्योंकि पहले के मुकाबले जो पिछली बार 10 लाख से वापस एक करोड़ रुपए की गई थी उसको वापस दस लाख रुपए कर दिया गया है टाइम पीरियड भी शायद एक सौ दिन से एक दिन कर दिया गया है और डायरेक्टर को इसका बेनिफिट है कि जो इंसॉल्वेंसी कर रहे हैं उसका जो पहले जो टोटली गवर्नमेंट या बैंक के पास था वो अब डायरेक्टर के थ्रू होगा तो वो भी एक अच्छा एक संभावना है कि डायरेक्टर अपनी कंपनी को भी बचा सकता है सेकेंडरी बहुत सारे डायरेक्टर ऐसे होते हैं कि कंपनी में किसी वजह से लॉसेज आ जाते हैं प्रॉब्लम आ जाती है उसमें इंसॉल्वेंसी में जाने के बाद पहले जो प्रॉब्लम थी कि उसको करीब करीब बैंक ही ले लेता था मैं ये समझता हूं कि इसके बाद वो कहीं से फंडिंग लाना चाह रहा है पैसा लगाना चाह रहा है किसी को पार्टनर बनाना चाह रहा है तो वो एक बहुत सारी संभावना है जि, जिस पे आप विस्तृत जानकारी देंगे पर उस वजह से वो अपनी कंपनी को बचा के अब आगे अपने उसी कंपनी से आगे काम कर सकता है इस इंसॉल्वेंसी से मैं जहां तक समझ रहा हूँ उसमें ये ऐसा है इसी के बाद साथ में चाहता हूँ कि हमारे जो एक्सपर्ट हैं आदित्य जी आप उनसे ज्यादा इसके बारे में जानकारी लेके और हमारे सभी मेंबर्स तक धन्यवाद थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सुरेश जी सो वी आर रियली ऑफ फोर्टी रिगार्डिंग द वेरी क्रूशियल टॉपिक दैट वी बी डिस्कसिंग टूडे So first of all let me introduce the moderator for the day 
So Dr. C.A. Abhishek Mishra ji is an associate partner in AAA Insolvency Professionals Limited. Uh, he is a chartered accountant with 17 years of industry experience in the field of finance, taxation, accounts, audit, and company law matters. Uh, his core expertise lies in offering advisory services to real estate, hospitality, education, and entertainment industry. Uh, he's a member of Indian Institute of Insolvency Professionals of ICAI and registered as an insolvency professional with IBBI. Member, he's a member of ICAI registered valuer organization and registers as a, as a valuer for asset class securities or financial assets with IBBI. He's also impaneled with MCA in their independent directors data bank and have been independent director at Rajasthan Medical Services Corporation Limited. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi ji. Uh, friends, <laughs> so, I think. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Abhishek, uh, I would like to hand over the session to you. And uh, you can go on uh, introducing uh, our speaker for the day and then uh, moderate the whole session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. Friends, I thank Fred Federation of Rajasthan Trade and Industry. 14 short, which is an apex chamber of trade and industry in the state of Rajasthan, for inviting me here today to moderate the session on pre-package insolvency resolution process, in short, PIRP, to be chaired by Shri Anil Goyal sir. I thank Goyal sir, who has graciously accepted the invite to be the, to be the speaker today on PIRP. Goyal sir is one of the most, most experienced IP in the country, having concluded 15 assignments in his name and presently acting as a liquidator in 10 companies. Some of the some of the known names are REI Agro Limited, Rotomac Group of Companies, LML Limited, Amrupali Group, Lanko Group, Nirav Modi Group, Visa Power, Varsana Ispath, etc. Either in his name or in the name of his partners. Kuilsar is the founder of AAA Insolvency Professional LLP, the largest insolvency professional entity in the country, having handled more than 190 assignments as IRP, RP liquidator collectively. Having the largest number of uh, having the largest number of 32 designated partners and 12 associate partners, having a human resource capital of 300 plus members working full time for insolvency and surpassing practice, having established offices and sitting partners at New Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Raipur, Ahmedabad, Chennai, Kochi, Bhubaneswar, Ludhiana, Kanpur, Pune, and and our very own Jaipur. Well, sir is also the founder and chairman of AAA Capital Services Private Limited a company engaged in the profession of resolution and enforcement agents under Sarvesi, having operations across 20 states in the country. He is also a non-executive chairman of AAA Valuation Professional LLP, an IBBI recognized, an IBBI recognized registered value entity for, for all asset classes. The valuation firm is having 13 partners and, in, and is doing many large assignments. He is also a senior partner in AAA G and company LLP Chartered Accountants. I thank uh, Sri Suresh, Suresh, Suresh Agarwalji, President Forty, for agreeing to join us today as a special guest. And I also thank my friend Aditi uh, for agreeing to be present among us today for the session sitting in Bombay. Now, before we proceed for the formal session, let me offer you a little insight on the rationale and idea behind introducing PIRP for MSME enterprises. MSME enterprises are critical for India's economy as they contribute significantly to its GDP and provide employment to a sizable population. Therefore, during the pandemic times, it was considered expedient to provide an effective alternate, alter, alternate of IRP for entities that are classified as MSME enterprises, ensuring quicker, cost-effective, value-maximizing outcomes for all the stakeholders in a manner which is least disruptive for the continuity of their businesses and which and which provides job and which preserves jobs. In order to achieve these objectives, it was considered expedient to introduce PIRP for MSMEs. That is the corporate persons classified as micro, small, and medium enterprises as per MSME Act 2030, 2006, as amended in July 2020. Now, as it stands today, a micro enterprise is the one which has invested in the plant and machinery up to 1 crore rupees and which has a turnover not exceeding 5 crore rupees. Small enterprise is the one that has invested in plant and machinery up to 10 crore rupees and turnover up to 50 crore rupees. A medium enterprise which has invested in plant and machinery up to 50 crore rupees and turnover does not exceed 250 crore rupees. So virtually in the state of Rajasthan, every other company, every company in Rajasthan will be virtually covered in this PIRP process. So now without taking much more time, I would request Shri Anil Goyal sir to take over from here and take you through the provisions of PIRP process for MSME sector. Uh, all over to you, sir. 
thank you abhishek uh, uh, it's a pleasure uh, uh, i'm being introduced by you and uh, thank you very much to the federation of rajasthan trade and industry uh, my special thanks to the president uh, uh, mr suresh agarwal my greetings to aditi khandelwal and she's been pleasantly uh, commencing the, pro the complete program today thank you abhishek sharma ji for all these efforts and i can see that this program is live on facebook and all your members as i'm told that this 40 in short is very popular in rajasthan and doing a lot of good work for industry and for society at large uh, mr agarwal also shared that this 90% of uh, industry in rajasthan is msme and with this new definition of uh, msme uh, i think uh, most of the industries in rajasthan would cover under under the definition of msme the uh, even abhishek mishra has given a little bit of uh, indication that the definition of uh, uh, msme has been changed with effect from 1st july uh, 2020 in fact the government of india was working on uh, a special package for msme uh, to handle resolution to handle uh, the financial stress and to handle insolvency because see the earlier insolvency law which was notified in december 2016 that was not really very uh, effective for msme as as a as a insolvency resolution process so therefore a new process was uh, completely uh, created for msme for uh, managing this financial stress of the companies so for that you see the first effort was to change uh, the first effort was to change the definition of msme where the Uh, investment in plant and machinery was changed from the the earlier limit to 50 crore and that too based on the return on value and the turnover is now up to 250 crores excluding export turnover that is the limit now so in case any company which is having less than 50 crores of return on value of plant and machinery and is having domestic turnover of less than 250 crore in the last year that company would be considered as msme so this is the uh, the changed one i would like to share uh, in case i have the sharing rights i would like to share my uh, ppt with you give me one minute so we would actually be working on this uh, ppt and for this pre packaged insolvency resolution process for msme so the complete the webinar today is on pre packaged insolvency resolution process in short we will say pirp in our conversation today uh, whenever i say pirp of a company or pirp of a that means that i am referring to pir pre packaged insolvency resolution process of a company which is msme because this structure this structure is only and only applicable to msme it is not applicable to uh, other than small medium and micro enterprises it is only applicable to those companies where in the last year the plant and machinery is less than 50 crores and the turnover is less than 250 crore then this structure is applicable now this uh, i would first of all give you a little bit of comparison like why it is required and it see two things that is very important in this pirp is this you see this pirp is i think before this i would actually say uh, let us try to understand uh, the what is the need of this uh, kind of structure this kind of framework so let us try to understand what are the existing structures available in the country under any law for insolvency resolution of uh, msme corporate debtors or for resolution of uh, msme corporate debtor 
or for restructuring or for one time settlement so all these things whenever i talk it basically means that the some structure some framework some law to handle the financial stress of a company the first is the insolvency law and we where we call it corporate insolvency resolution process that law is applicable to msme where anyone any creditor can file an insolvency application against the company and the insolvency of the that msme corporate debtor can be started in the last 4 4 and a half years it has been experienced by all of us including the government that for msme industry the most important is the uh, existing promoters who are running the company and it has been experienced that uh, when the existing promoters are not there or they fear that the company will be taken away by somebody else then the operations are likely to be stopped and that actually has actually been uh, the reason for bringing some better framework which would be more uh, friendly to corporate debtors which will be more friendly to promoters so i will come to that and the second uh, structure which is court supervised where the nclt would be uh, giving a authority on that or giving a final order that is a compromise or arrangement application under section 230 uh, where the company files an application to nclt and uh, then this also includes corporate debt restructuring and also restructuring between the uh, shareholders so that's not something that we are talking about we are only talking about that part which also covers corporate debt restructuring then there are two other options which are out of the court and one is the rbi prudential framework uh, where the rbi has issued a circular i'll come back to that and the last is the informal restructuring ots which is most popular presently in the banks and most of the msme they actually Uh, struggle getting a restructuring or rescheduling or getting a OTS with the banks. So when we talk about these structures, the CIRP, which is Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process, that when this uh, CIRP starts, the business is taken over by the RP and the powers of the board of directors are suspended. So this is a disruption in the business. so that means that the business will not be run by the directors business will be run by the rp where sometimes it has been seen that the rp is not able to take those kind of decisions which a promoter can take because most of the information are available with the promoters and directors of the company so therefore this is uh, the cirp uh, for msme has not been considered good when the control when the business when the custody of the assets is taken over by the uh, rp so there are three things in uh, this the PI, cirp and pirp three changes in cirp the control and custody of the business and assets of the company is taken over by rp under coc in pirp this is not done this is this is not supposed to be the duty of the rp and the control and custody of the business and assets will remain with the board of directors or promoters whatever you call a second is the responsibility of keeping the company as a going concern that in cirp lies with the rp under coc whereas in pirp it lies with the promoter so they are responsible for keep the company as a going concern so the this is a second difference the third difference is that the protection and preservation of the assets of the company that also in cirp it is the responsibility of the rp whereas in pirp it is the responsibility of the board of directors so these three different these three changes are the vast changes in the structure the new framework the uh, it is called that the uh, debtor in possession in cirp it is called creditor in possession because in cirp the creditor will take over the possession of everything and then would manage the insolvency by calling resolution plans in pirp debtor remains in possession and while the debtor is in possession the resolution plans can be invited from public at large and the first preference would be given to the 
resolution plan of the existing board of directors or existing management in cirp promoters are out mostly and they are not eligible for submitting resolution plan therefore they resist the insolvency they fight that the insolvency should not be started they represent before ncit that it is disputed or it is false or it is uh, not a kind of natural justice so in cirp we have seen a lot of litigation and uh, it litigation on account of avoiding transaction also and because of the limited capacity of uh, uh, nclt uh, the cirp is taking much more time it is expected that the pirp will not take much time because the time period which is mentioned in the law is only one month for nclt to pass an order for approval of the resolution plan cirp was expensive so the msme uh, was not able to afford it whereas it is the pirp is let, less expensive and the fee and the cost of the uh, process would be contributed by the company and not by the uh, creditors so then uh, the in the cirp we have seen that the uh, when the cirp starts the promoters were not leaving any asset or any liquid money in the company because they were uh, apprehensive that the rp will take away everything so nothing was left in the company so it was found difficult to protect the assets preserve the assets because there is no money available uh, the biggest difference is that in case cirp fails the company goes into liquidation however in case the pirp fails the company doesn't go to liquidation the board of directors will continuously run this company as they were doing it before so in the Uh, uh, a CIRP, the resolution plans are submitted, taken from the market, and uh, the there is no preference to this resolution plan submitted by the promoters. However, in PIRP, the resolution plan, a resolution plan is uh, preferred. Uh, the resolution plan submitted by the promoters is preferred. That resolution plan is called base resolution plan. so mostly that is preferred by the creditors because they have already given some kind of in principle approval before even filing of the pirp so in all these causes the the value of the company normally diminish and uh, the banks are required to uh, banks are required to uh, create make provisions in their books of account and which is causing loss to their balance sheet the second option which is available in the market presently is that it is available under the laws that the compromise or arrangement scheme under section 230 of the companies act uh, see there are differences between this company this this scheme and the pirp in pirp the company gets moratorium so that nobody from outside can attack or can start any proceedings to recover their dues or to sell the assets so there is a moratorium available under pirp and cirp whereas under this 230 scheme there is no moratorium available 75% of the creditors need to give consent for any restructuring or compromise proposal as against 66 in cirp and pirp the uh, the scheme of uh, uh, compromise under section 230 is is only binding on the company and the creditors who participated it is it is not applicable to everyone who is not participating into the process and the process of 230 doesn't have any time limit the process is very long the multiple meetings with the creditors and multiple um, uh, time this kind of meetings are directed by nclt and then under the supervision of some uh, supervisor or chairman of the meetings that would be appointed by nclt all this is a process of uh, section 230 of the companies act then as a lot of litigation is expected in section 230 applications because most of the creditors will say that we are a separate class and we need a, a separate voting so that 75% of our class would also be uh, voting for the uh, would also be voting for the uh, resolutions so uh, the process is not really very popular except in the case of mergers acquisitions demergers and amalgamation otherwise it is not very popular no this uh, rbi circular one that it this it is if see we are talking about that rbi circular which was dated 7th of june 2019 and this is presently applicable only to debt 
uh, which is more than 1500 crore and it is uh, it, it cannot be initiated by other creditors plus yes it can be uh, but then it is not uh, uh, obligatory on the financial creditors to see to this kind of proposals so this also uh, lenders are representing 75 percent the vote of the total understanding and 60 percent of the total lenders in uh, number they have to uh, be uh, it is binding on them so uh, there are not many creditors not all the creditors are under the rbi monitoring so this scheme uh, this framework is only applicable to those creditors who are under rbi monitoring so there are many insurance companies like mutual funds the venture holders real estate allotees or even offshore creditors they are outside the rbi's monitoring domain such creditors uh, are are not liable to go through this process so this therefore this process uh, is is not uh, one that it is a court out of court process the uh, there is no uh, section 53 applicable to this framework section 53 says uh, that the when the assets of the company is finishing finishes then nobody else will get uh, the money and that is applicable virtually without even selling the asset that is based on the valuation of assets so in case the um, total assets of the company uh, are 50 crores and the liabilities are 100 crore then when 50 crore is uh, uh, given to the uh, creditors so the anyone who is not got would not have any entitlement to claim in future that's what is the insolvency law and the company will run uh, however, there is a priority under Section 53 that who will get first and who will get second and who will get third. So based on that priority, whatever assets are there, based on that value of the asset, the resources will have to be allocated to all uh, the creditors as per the priority given in Section 53. So this uh, circular of RBI is also not really very uh, uh, kind of uh, popular. Uh, because see, it needs uh, some RP rating four, and it also needs uh, the the consent of all the partners. So it is it is not really working well. So uh, the government has now come up with the structuring uh, or uh, uh, OTS or resolution of the MSME, and this PIRP has been introduced for that. Presently, what we do as an MSME, whenever there is a financial stress, we try to find uh, partners, we try to find some investor. However, that investor would uh, see the company's balance sheet, he would see that the liabilities of the bank, the market liabilities, and the liabilities from the statutory authorities is very high. So even if he's ready to invest in the basic business model, which is still a bit of positive, he would not be comfortable in participating in the company as a partner, as a shareholder, as an investor. So, so therefore, uh, no law or no frame, framework was available in the country that if a company has some uh, high debt, which is not able to, which the company is not able to service, which the company is not repay, is not able to repay out of the income, then the company need uh, some. Uh, bigger uh, infusion of capital so that the company's debt is reduced and then the company can survive in future so those kind of opportunities in case it was in case the investors are available in case the shareholders are available the the partners are available then they would not participate into that particular company which is the main company where this financial stress is so they probably will try to create new companies and the investment will come in new company because no the person who has money in the pocket would like to buy any uncertainty because buying a company uh, in open market with a lot of liabilities that means that we are buying uncertainty you are not sure when somebody will invoke surface when somebody will file a case against the company when somebody will come and file an insolvency against the company and your all investment will be completely sunk so that scenario is uh, being tried to be resolved now when we say uh, that scenario is being resolved. That means that the now the uh, the any entrepreneur, uh, ent entrepreneur, uh, any entrepreneur can find an investor, and if the entrepreneur is not happy about the existing liabilities, then that entrepreneur can uh, roll out through the uh, PIRP pre-packaged insolvency resolution process 
where the banks would actually give uh, uh, a kind of uh, in principle approval before even the application is submitted to nclt that part is uh, uh, very important otherwise also if a company is under financial stress and the, uh, the this is the kind of insolvency resolution even if there is no customer from outside even if the promoters only would like to go ahead with the financial restructuring or kind of one time settlement they are when they are looking at some kind of uh, 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 relief from the bank that structure uh, uh, was not there so uh, presently like in case anyone has to go to their bank for any restructuring the they he will simply go and uh, knock their door uh, hardly there is any uh, policies of the rbi or circulars of the rbi it is every bank is just working around their own policies they may or they may not attend and there is no timeline rather they would uh, uh, they, they would actually create more stress in the company and the company might even get, go into deeper default so uh, the uh, the creditors uh, they have to do this settlement uh, which is uh, based on their commercial wisdom so that also can be done through pirp uh, the uh, you might have seen where some professionals are also uh, likely to participate in today's webinar so uh, there are uh, a lot of cases where the access working access working capital uh, uh, finance is converted into working capital term loan or even funded interest term loan then some interest free term loan some concessional rate of interest is also applied by some restructuring experts repayment is based on the earning capacity of the, based on the future business plan uh, deferment of term loan installments is also part of this uh, uh, restructuring that we uh, ask from the bank however the bank will normally come with a recompense clause even if they have given you some 10% rebate they would al always come with a recompense clause that in case the company would in case the company would get some Uh, uh good profits in future then whatever loss that we have taken that would be recompensed to the creditors so in most of the cases promoters contribution is also asked and the additional funds are also given by the creditors uh, however there is no committee structure there is no formal structure there is no timing uh, section 53 is not applicable so all this is uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, hurdles in the restructuring or one time settlement proposals since there is no process where the bankers are comfortable with getting an assessment from the market how much the market is offering that assessment is also not possible in uh, the normal restructuring proposals time taken is very high so uh, there is uh, no open competition uh, there is no process of inviting bids from arts outside parties so we've seen that even if there is uh, something which is not uh, workable the uh, this is the, the normally the companies go into deep uh, uh, red the higher debt amount and the banks will start process of recovery so uh, like Ab abhishek in case there is any question so far so we can even take up questions in between Uh, what would be the format? Because if we started at twelve, it's already twelve fifty-five. So we should take some questions also. Sir, currently on the chat box, uh, uh, I see no questions. So maybe you know uh, we can cover a bit of it more, and then I'll raise some questions. So uh, I think there is a there is no question on the chat box because the people are not logging in here. So sorry. Uh, we have to just look into the facebook also because the people may be asking questions at facebook only they may not be asking sir, questions one, here sir sir one question that i see uh, is that somebody is asking why will the bankers or financial creditors agree you know uh, in a msme platform where they've got adequate uh, uh, adequate collateral ava collaterals available with them So, in case of a MSME where there is a personal guarantee of the directors, also adequate, uh, it is adequately covered by the real estate also of the companies. So, you know, what is the incentive for a bank uh, or a financial creditor to agree to the proposition of PIRP? 
I think this is a very important question and, and the answer must be uh, also very important. So what I'm trying to uh, say here is uh, before anyone is trying to uh, invoke PIRP, one has to make an estimate of the total uh, value of the company and the assets which is mortgaged to the banks. Now the value of the company, when we assess the value of the company, that is only considering the fixed assets and also the current assets, uh, that is something which is the, uh, the valuation, the, uh, the registered valuer will give a valuation that these are the total uh, assets of the company. And these are some additional assets which are mortgaged to the banks by the promoters. So for example, there are 50 crores assets which are mortgaged by the company and the 50 and the, and the 30 crore assets are which are the personal assets of the directors who have given the guarantee. So there are total in any case, the 80 crore is the asset, <clears throat> 80 crore is the asset which the bank has with them as a collateral security as primary security. And the company, if the company is under financial stress, that definitely means that the company has incurred some losses and the and there is a default. So when the company defaults, that means that the company is under financial stress. And whenever there is a, whenever, whenever there is a financial stress, that means that the assets are likely to be reducing. So in case uh, the company is having 80 crores of assets and then the entire amount, the, the assets are also backed by the same kind of liabilities or rather the liabilities are lesser in such cases. However, the assets are not liquid. Therefore, there is a default and therefore there is a uh, need for some kind of deferment. So if there is a need for deferment, it is only a question of understanding by the bank that if there is a company which has got 80 crores of asset and my facilities are 60 crores and the company is facing some difficulty in fund flow, so we need to only manage the fund flow so that the that proposal, which will actually defer some of the term loan installments, that will defer some or convert some of the working capital into working capital term loan, that kind of proposal also would give some breathing time to the company before somebody comes and strangulate the company and somebody might even come and start the insolvency of the company. So that way, the banks will try to compare with the two situations. In case we don't do this, in case we don't participate into PIRP, then what would be the next action that we can see from the creditors? So in case the banks doesn't agree to the PIRP, that first of all means that they feel that the company is not really insolvent, the company is having assets. Then we need to explain to the banks that it is not a question of assets. Presently, there is no fund flow because most of the money which is stuck up in the assets is not going to be recovered in the next five months or six months. In that process, some people will file cases against me. Some people will file, file my checks will start bouncing. I will be subject to criminal liabilities. And all this, when we explain to the bank, and again, we explain that in case you do this restructuring through the uh, PIRP structure of NCLT, that would be binding on anyone. And that would be binding on the uh, earlier creditor or uh, supplier or government duty, government responsibility, uh, the statutory liabilities. So everything would be managed along with the financial stress, which is from the bank. So the bank's financial stress is normally much lesser. The bigger, uh, the, see the, <laughs> unless the bank starts uh, kind of uh, uh, recovery processes. So uh, the banks would uh, agree in those cases where the assets are much lesser than the uh, total outstanding. The banks, because they understand that in case we don't accept the PIRP, then somebody will go for CIRP. So that means that we can actually try to revive the company. We can try to provide some relief to the company and that would be better because banks also understand that the total value of the assets in case it is 80 crore, when the bank will go for a sale of these assets to recover, taking possession of these assets, then in that case, one that the value also diminish and uh, the other is that the, it becomes disruptive, the business closes and the loss to the banks would be much more than as it would be in PIRP. 
it is only a question of banks understanding it is uh, like it is not a question of uh, like the banks is uh, banks why the banks will accept the banks will first understand and as a company as a promoter we will first make them understand then only they will step on our proposal and they will they will uh, uh, do working on that proposal so uh, this is what abhishek because this is a question is very important in fact my last slides i am actually showing that yes the what are the apprehensions of the banks and how we have to tackle those apprehensions i have uh, also one question mm -hmm. uh, like see visa wise in uh, cirp where the rent uh, promoters like say anil ambani uh, the vadwans of uh, you know uh, that hpcl company yeah. so uh, now after the so after the supreme court judgment uh, even even when the companies have gone into cirp the banks can go after the rent promoters and yes. invoke the personal guarantee in cirp so i believe right. in cirp this is my submission to you you may correct me if i'm wrong so can this also be one one advantage for a company to go into pirp take the financial creditors into confidence and uh, get a one time settlement with the blessing blessings of nclt visa is going in a cirp and saving themselves from that from invocation of personal guarantees because in the msme loan in 100% of the cases there is a personal guarantee by the uh, of the directors and shareholders right so in uh, in the uh, judgment of uh, jain versus union of india uh, the supreme court has held that yes the insolvency of the personal guarantors can be started under the insolvency law and uh, now uh, one uh, uh, see like it is also said that even if the resolution plan is approved the uh, guarantors would be proceeded against so there is no issues uh, now it comes to pirp in case in the pirp the base resolution plan with the modification is accepted that means that the there is an original loan of 100 crore when we actually went through the pirp and the bank also invited resolution plans from public and the bank also thought that nothing more than 50 crore would be payable to the bank rest all would actually have gone into losses already and there is no asset or the bank also feel that in case we go and recover our money from the enforcement of security interest then they would really they would actually realize much less than what they actually have thought about because see under surface also there are possibilities of stay and there are possibilities of under realization of the funny in the auction process so the uh, the banks will feel that it is a better chance to give uh, to to process uh, the pirp try to find out the value of the company in the market in case somebody will come and give us higher amount then then we will go with that person in case nobody will come then we will hand it over to the promoters so as they would run as it is running and in the meantime we can even offer uh, the uh, we can even offer some additional facilities uh, to the corporate debtor and the banks can also think that we can even defer some of the payments because in case the banks don't do anything that that means that the end of the company will come next year but in case the bank does uh, some of the efforts that is required under the insolvency law then there can be two options one that the company will lie after four years and the second option is that the company will actually revive uh, immediately or within four years so this chance has to be taken by the bank it is only a question of awareness that when a company is under some financial stress then how to handle uh this uh, financial stress so that there is no loss to the creditors or banks who have given loan so this uh, uh, this is very clear that the in case the resolution plan of the grantors would be accepted in case the resolution plan of the grantors would be accepted it would be accepted along with the personal guarantees in otherwise it will be a clash of interest Mm -hmm. no what is the clash of interest abhishek the first is that the bankers are trusting the same promoters they are approving a base resolution plan they are saying in the resolution plan that we will we are okay with 50% haircut and the other creditors are also given haircut uh, in case they agree to all these things and they would like to uh, start fresh with the uh, with the entrepreneur then how can they say 
that no, we would proceed against the grunters and uh, we will uh, make them insolvent uh, because they know that as per law, anyone who actually goes bankrupt will not have uh, any power to do business for at least one year. So the bankers would actually be doing a, making a decision in clash that we are trusting A, we are handing over the company to A, we, we are approving the base resolution plan of A. However, uh, uh, the, uh, we are not, uh, we will proceed against him, against our personal guarantee on the amount which we have lost in the resolution process. So that's not something that they would uh, do because once they do this, the NCLT will tell them that one side that you are trusting the promoter and you are also trying to say that the, 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 the promoter will run the company and will make the repayment of the loan to us. On the same breath, you are saying that we will proceed against the promoter, we will bank, make him bankrupt, we will not even allow him to do the business. So this is the contradiction. So it is really not possible to my understanding that the base resolution plan of the promoter is acceptable, accepted by the creditors. And in the meantime, they start proceeding against the uh, director because that actually will hurt the entire uh, the resolution process, revival process. So then yes, we I can say. say maybe, it, um, sir, then we can say maybe, you know, PIRP offers a better revenue to the promoters in MSME segment vis-a-vis going into surface or letting their company slip into CIRP. Where there no, nobody, would be no, more obligations. No promoter, should, uh, uh, no promoter should allow any CIRP application. No promoter should allow any surface action. Before all these eventualities, the promoter should approach the banks to do PIRP. Right, right. Sir. As you may have seen, Abhishek, everyone used to do one thing that whenever there used to be any financial stress, you probably will see that many promoters, more than 50% promoters would give a restructuring proposal or an OTS proposal, which is presently there is no structure and therefore all these uh, proposals some here get, get lost in the bank. Or even if there is some meetings on this proposal, then no conclusive things are happening. So in the case of PIRP, in case the promoters have decided that they can go for PIRP, then uh, there is, the promoters have a right official right to call the bankers on a meeting where the promoters will explain their business plan, their future, and how would they like to pay the bank's dues? If not 100%, then maybe what percentage? That's what is a base resolution plan. And that, that base resolution plan is prepared by the promoters. They have the first right to take the company unless somebody else is offering very high amount and the promoters are not able to match that amount then only the uh, then only the promoters would not be entitled to take away the company yes abhishek right, sir. sir we can uh, proceed there are no further questions good so in this uh, 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 eligibility of the pirp i think i've been discussing in my conversation that is only for msme msme definition has changed with effect from 1st of july 2020 and the minimum, the default that we have to show to NCLT would be 10 lakhs. And that default is not necessary that it should be from the banks or it should be with the cooperational creditor or should be, should be employees. Anywhere somebody is entitled to take 10 lakhs or rupees from, 10 lakhs or rupees from the company and is not able to get, he is a person who actually is considered, that is the amount which is considered to be a default. If we are not able to pay our money, our bills on the day due date, that is called a default. So the default, uh, proving a default in for the PIRP is very easy because you definitely will find something which is 10 lakhs of rupees. That means that we actually purchased some goods from someone and we agreed for uh, uh, payment on delivery. The delivery has been done and the payment has not been done. So we are defaulting. So that kind of default is all right. That is what is the default uh, definition. The, the, the other thing is the, uh, regarding the eligibility that any company which has gone through CIRP cannot apply for PIRP. Uh, any, any company where the liquidation has or order has been passed that also cannot apply for PIRP. Any company which is not eligible under section 29A uh, that is like uh, willful defaulter convicted for defense uh, punishment and there are some uh, 
so these are the eligibilities for a company to go ahead for PIRP for MSME. The new definition we've already discussed. I just want to say that the definition is uh, the the amount of uh, the investment in plant and machinery will be picked up from the income tax return, and that too the return on value. It will be taken from the last year's income tax return, and the department will take it from the uh, income tax uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, records. That what is the WDV that has to be presented when the application is filed. That what is the WDV as per the income tax records. Now, as per the income tax records, even the cars are part of the plant and machinery, whereas the as per Companies Act, it is not part of the uh, plant and machinery. So. Even if a company, even if a company has uh, uh, too many cars and less of plant and machinery, that actually means that the company would uh, be uh, it will be all the cars, uh, plant and machinery, equipment, electrical fittings, vehicles, trucks, buses, all that would be considered as plant and machinery, including some of the books or some of the softwares which are used for the uh, profession or uh, which are used for uh, any kind of uh, uh, activities of the company. Uh, the the pollution control uh, uh, the pollution control equipment, research and development equipment, industry safety equipment, jigs, dyes, molds. These are all excluded from the definition of plant and machinery. So these are all excluded from the definition of plant and machinery. And in the turnover, it is only the export turnover which is excluded. So 250 crores of turnover. 50 crores of investment in assets as per the WDV of income tax. These are the two criteria. However, nowadays the registration is very important. Every MSME is supposed to get the registration, a fresh registration, and the last date for that is uh, the last date for that is the first uh, of uh, July 2021. And uh, the uh, form is very easy. It is the you have to go to the Udyam registration online portal. And Udyam registration portal will do all this for you. Uh, registration would be done, and the duties also can be uh, uh, allocated. So this registration is the process which is required. So now Abhishek, uh, the PIRP. Uh, Abhishek, what is the kind of time that we have to finish? Uh, sir, we have uh, another one hour. Okay, good. Abhishek, am I right? Abhishek, sir, it was 12 to 2, so we have, we have got another 50 minutes. Okay. So it's depend on <laughs> you people, sir, till how long you want to continue. It's not an issue. People are hearing this program. Okay, okay. So, like, now let us come to the process. I am not going to explain the process of, uh, as I normally explain to other professionals. I would simply explain, keeping in view that the most of the audience today would be entrepreneurs of MSME. So I will not do it clause by clause. I would only do it uh, on phases. What is the first phase, second phase, third phase, and the last phase? Uh, so uh, that will also be like in a, in a very, very uh, relaxed uh, language that I would be using rather than a very, very technical and section-wise language. So whenever we think about uh, approaching the bank for PIRP, first of all, we need to understand our own books, our own assets, our own liabilities. So that is the first thing that we need to see how much assets we have, what would be the market value in case the bank sells these assets in the market, and what are the collateral securities and what is the value of the of those collateral securities in case the bank, uh, in case the bank or creditor uh, try to sell these assets, how much they would recover. So this is a real condition of the company assets and liabilities. So that is where the entire planning would be done. Then the second thing is that how much the company can pay from the income of the company. What is the present income? What would be the future income? And how much the company can, uh, how much the company can serve every month, what can be the uh, interest and installments which is company can pay based on the projections. 
all the assets current assets stocks should be brought down to the actual uh, position and there should not be any kind of uh, exaggerated stocks in the balance sheet or any asset appearing in the balance sheet which is not recoverable or which is not to be which cannot be monetized so these are the first of first few things that you have to do whenever you do uh, try getting any restructuring run the yeah, basic finance to apne ko payment limit ki zarurat thodi na icic se jo 2 crore rupaye apne pass kara rakhe hain nahi na aur ye mal wala okay so this is called the first of all the base resolution plan the every company will prepare a base resolution plan at this particular moment the company will engage a consultant and that consultant will try to understand the financial position and options available and then the consultant will guide that how much working capital access that you have and how much additional working capital you would be requiring and what kind of restructuring proposal would be uh, submitted to the bank so that proposal that proposal is called base resolution plan where you can say that we will uh, ask for uh, uh, the refacement of the installments deferment of the installments and we can even ask for some interest rebate because we have suffered suffered loss we can even ask for some waiver of the loan because we suffered loss in the past so all this is possible they can even waive the loan they can reduce the loan they can take the haircut they can give some interest which is on a concessional rate so various things that the powers are lying with the banks and the lenders that can be done so this is this proposal is called base resolution plan and the second uh, uh, is the uh, one declaration by the one directors resolution shareholders resolution the other direct the list is like the list of creditors and all this has to be Uh, done uh, and uh, the promoters would actually it's difficult part but the preparation of base resolution plan is difficult you might have to engage a local consultant who may be a chartered accountant for preparing these projected financial statements which is called base resolution plan taking assumptions of insolvency restructuring the entire business within the own companies uh, also like um, uh, some of the shareholders may come some of the shareholders may go although the overall partnerships are also being handled through pirp all this is uh, possible this is all is the part of the preparation uh, then at this moment it is very important that i am saying now so uh, abhishek this is this part that i am saying once a company decides that the company will opt and uh, for for pirp then with all these four or five documents which is base resolution plan shareholders declaration special resolution of the members and other documents all like a list of creditors and etc then all these can be communicated to the bank and then we should announce that we are going for pirp therefore the meeting in our office or somebody else's office meeting will be convened on this date at this time and all the matters would be discussed in that meeting that is the starting point so if this is the starting point then uh, the bankers are supposed to comply with that notice the promoters will give notice to the bank that we have invoked the provisions of pirp these are the details which are required to be submitted to you when minimum 5 days notice is required to be given so we are giving you a 5 days notice and meeting will happen meeting will took place meeting will be uh, uh, done at the, maybe uh, on a particular date at a particular time so then uh, uh, the this this is this will be submitted by the company to the financial creditors and all the financial creditors are who who are the financial creditors anyone who has given any loan to the company anyone who has given loan to a company is called a financial creditor and the proposal will go to financial creditors and they might discuss uh, internally with other banks and then they might even decide about participating into the mini, uh, the uh, meetings so this is mandatory for the banks to come to the meeting mandatory means like it is directed by the regulations that whenever there is something written in the law that they are supposed to go there they are supposed to attend the meeting i don't think they would skip these meeting this is what my this is what my belief is there i've already explained the resolution plan documents required for the resolution plan and all the preparation that we have to do that's also done 
so the first part uh, that we uh, had that the the promoter should prepare themselves for pirp that is what is discussed now the second is that the financial creditors in a, in the meetings um, will ask the uh, will will ask the promoter that we are in principally okay to appoint an uh, a, an insolvency professional then they will try to find out who is the appropriate insolvency professional for this and after calling and having discussions with them the banks will propose the name of the resolution professional uh, the name of the person who would be appointed as i uh, as rp in this case uh this uh, then at that particular time uh, the role of rp will start so first what we did first of all the first uh, the first phase was to understand your own company to make a base resolution plan to make projections of future turnover and profitability to make projections how much you would be able to give it back to the banks uh, all this is a first stage preparation of resolution and the uh, a board and shareholders uh, resolutions and the list of creditors all this is uh, uh, all these are uh, the first phase in the second phase now the banks after having two three meetings banks have the power to negotiate on the base resolution plan and banks will say okay uh, in case you are not doing any fraudulent transactions you also have to declare to the banks that we are not doing any uh, fraudulent undervalued or preferential transactions that Uh, will also be told to the banks, and the, the bank can in, then in that case the bank will in principally approve uh, that the company may go for PIRP, and the RP would be appointed by the financial creditors, and the RP will start RP will start its own functions. Now at by this time there are two person. One is a consultant who is hand holding the company, preparing the base resolution plan, also preparing various resolutions, uh, uh, board resolution and list of creditors as per the format. So that's a consultant who actually is working with the promoters. And now the second part is the resolution professional who has been appointed by, who has been appointed by the uh, large creditors. Uh, so uh, this at this stage there are two professionals. so one is working with the company the other is working with the committee of creditors then uh, the meetings will take place and in meetings the bank will say okay uh, you go ahead so then the uh, application will be submitted to adjudicating authority after in um, in principal approval of the creditors after in principal approval of the approval of the creditors the application would be submitted to nclt with the consent of the rp uh so that application uh, would result in that applicable would result in the commencement of cirp so now the cirp has been commenced uh, so abhishek what do you think like you can even ask questions from your own mind also because you are also well versed with what kind of questions people are asking you can also ask so now first preparation that we did is preparing about the company second part is that we are now interacting with the banks we are discussing the resolution plan with them we are trying to find out what is their what are their interests so accordingly the resolution plan can have multiple iterations we can have multiple versions of the resolution plan and then they will say they, that we uh, we we approve in principle that the you can go to pir you can go to pirp with this ncrt approval because see till now uh, the uh, who will file the application to uh, who will file application to nclt now the final clarity that the application will be filed by the uh, cd uh, however after passing a resolution in the board meeting and in the directors meeting of the investor so that actually will give some authenticity to the uh, to the uh, restructuring project now the second stage is over and the banks have agreed in principle to support the project to support and revive the company now let yeah, us come I, to uh, yes please abhishek so i just, just post a couple of questions yeah. so you know once banks have once banks have approved it so is there a chance of this pirp failing after that also yes see 
is NCLT duty bound to accept it in case both the parties are agreeing? Or mm. if there or are there chances that you know it may still not uh, get through the uh, get through the NCLT? So now I think uh, we have uh, landed into the third phase, and your question is also related to the third phase. Uh, we have uh, uh, two phases uh, we've already seen, and the third phase is now the RP is doing its job. RP has been appointed. He is doing all uh, the jobs which RP is likely to do in CIRP also. The RP is not doing three things. Again, I would repeat because this clarity is very important for the entrepreneurs, for the MSME corporate debtors, that the RP is not doing three things. In such cases, RP is appointed by the uh, RP is appointed by the banks. RP has been appointed by the NCLT also because in this case NCLT doesn't have much role because nobody will be opposing the application. The application is filed by the promoters, board of directors. The financial creditors have already given their consent to file an application on the, uh, the for PIRP. So there is no likelihood that the court will take a lot of time. It will be it will be an order within one month because the NCLT only have to see the documents attached. So now the uh, NCLT has also passed. Uh, an order where the RP has been appointed. And now let us see what the RP and the committee of creditor will do. After the uh, first sir, phase- just one, Sorry, yes. sir. Uh, yes, yes. Sir, sir, just one last question before we move on to the third uh, level. Sir, does it uh, does PIRP raise any hope for MSMEs which have already been dragged into uh, you know CIRP through section 7, 8, 9, 10? Do they have any hope or they have to pass through CIRP process only? No, they- Cannot uh, now with the, if they if uh, the CIRP case is withdrawn if the CIRP is withdrawn then they can I'll just uh, there is a special scenario that I would definitely attend and that special scenario is uh, uh, what happens to the existing applications uh, no this is not there I will just see where it appears so I will just tell you what exactly this is I, I don't need uh, the support of that. Uh, PPT. So the scenario is that if any application is pending, if uh, any application under section 7, 9 or 10 is pending, then the, uh, the NCLT will first dispose of those applications and then will consider the application for PIRP. That means in case all those applications are rejected, then the PRP application can be uh, considered. Uh, in case the CIRP has already started, there is no way that the CIRP can be withdrawn unless the committee of creditors decide about it. This is the uh, second. Otherwise, there is, uh, there, there is no hope that once the CIRP starts, unless the CIRP is totally withdrawn and uh, the, uh, the COC also is okay with 90% voting that the application under section 12A is withdrawn. So two stages, one, that for a company whose applications are already filed in NCLT, that company will have to first uh, defend uh, itself from those applications. And in case all those applications are rejected, then the company can go for PIRP. Uh, second is the CIRP is already started. Then also uh, the, uh, the entire CIRP has to be quashed under section 12A by way of withdrawal. Then only the PIRP can be started. Uh, the third third part is that the uh, when the application for CIRP is filed by any creditor, then within uh, 14 days, within 14 days, if the company, if the corporate debtor files an application for PIRP, then those applications under section seven, nine, and ten will be kept in abeyance, and PIRP application will be heard first. Fourth scenario is that in case the PIRP application is filed and later on section seven, nine or 10 is also filed, then, so then in that case, the PIRP application will proceed first. The NCLT will decide about the PIRP application. Then only the other applications will be considered. So I'm moving on to the uh, third uh, stage where the RP has been appointed and the RP is doing its job. The three things that the RP is not supposed to do, take control and custody of the business and assets of the company. Number two, the RP is not responsible for keeping the company as a going concern. Number three, the protection and prevention of the uh, 
assets of the copywriter, the three things are not the obligation of the RP. All everything, the business will be conducted by the uh, board of directors. Uh, all decisions regarding purchase, sale, everything will be done by the board of directors. There may be a case that the committee of creditors, when the committee is constituted, the committee might say to the promoters, to the directors that while you are doing the business, but these following businesses that you would not do uh, without our written consent. And those businesses may be, uh, it depends on the committee of creditors wisdom, but those decisions may be that you would not sell any asset, you would not repay any loan, you will not take any loan, uh, or, or you will not close the business. All these are the, be, be, these are the decisions which the committee would say that you would not take it without our positive consent. So otherwise you continue with your business. Otherwise, other than this, RP is supposed to do everything uh, other than these three things. RP is also supposed to supervise the operations of the company. RP can ask information from the promoters that you provide with the information. There can be a system of developing an MIS so that the uh, complete information is provided to RP. So the RP can also share this information to the creditors so that they start making up their mind what kind of resolution plan they need and what kind of uh, 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 resolution plan will be appropriate in this case. So this part is only for the fee. I only have to say one thing uh, because primarily we are working today for the uh, for the MSME entrepreneurs. So the uh, RP will give an estimate of the fees. RP will give an estimate of the fees and the fee would be provided, the fee would be provided by the promoters in a bank account. In a bank account and that bank account will be operated by RP. So the entire fee, estimated fee, that would be uh, uh, whatever fee the COC would approve, that amount will be deposited by the promoters in a bank account, which will be operated by the RP. So in case the expenditures are more, then the committee of creditor will ask again to the promoters to contribute more. And in case the expenditures are less, finally that money will go back to the company only. So the cost is to be borne by the uh, corporate data. The cost includes the fees of the RP, the fees of the valuer, fees of the transaction auditor, and maybe some of the other uh, legal expenditure and uh, legal application, legal hearing. So all these are the, ex or the expenditures on meetings. So these are the only expenditures that are likely to happen out of that amount, which will be contributed by the corporate data. So RP is uh, now on work. Uh, like I would, this this uh, this this was the one part which was skipped uh, in the second phase because the application was filed and what are the formats of the application and there is a fees for the application which is fifteen thousand rupees for the fees. Application needs a lot of documents and that, and those are documents can be uh, that, that documents can be always. Uh, uh, submitted the document can be always submitted now the uh, when we talk about the total timeline uh, the total timeline in this case is uh, uh, in the law it is written 120 days out of this 120 days 30 days are uh, pre-reserved for nclt to approve the resolution plan so virtually 90 days the rp has to work in within 90 days that is the reason that the RP is appointed even at the time of application, the role of the RP starts before even filing of the application because the RP is supposed to prepare a detailed report on the company, on the eligibility of the company for PIRP and on the operations of the company. All this is supposed to be uh, prepared by the RP in the first phase before even NCLT passes an order and appoint him. So the RP would negotiate two fees with you, two parts of the fee. One part is the pre-PIRP and the other is the PIRP. And there may be a third part, which is not supposed to be discussed. That is a technical thing, because in case the committee of creditors can also decide that the business may be taken control because the promoters are not cooperating. So let us take control of the business. So if the control of the business is taken by the uh, 
uh, RP after the resolution is approved by the committee of creditors, then there can be a different fee because see taking control and custody of the business involves a lot of effort and infrastructure. So that fee may be higher. So the post NCLT appointment, post NCLT order, as per the law, it is only 120 days. So I have discussed the total timeline of this uh, process. So if we start today and we hire a, a consultant, he would start preparing the resolution plan and he will also get an approval from the shareholders and directors. So when we take the approval from the directors and the shareholders, that is considered to be a, a, a day zero. From that date, 90 days will start. And this, this 90 days is considered pre-PIRP period. The pre-PIRP pre period uh, it facilitate that a lot of things that are supposed to be done in the subsequent uh, 90 days, uh, the RP should do it much before that. RP should do it much before that because after that, the timelines are very, very aggressive and RP may not be able to do everything within that timeline. So therefore, uh, see this, therefore this scenario that we are trying to talk is that the uh, first phase of the RP 90 days or even less than 90 days because the creditors may appoint him about a month before. Whatever time he gets, he will take information, he will format, he, he will make formats and uh, he will keep everything absolutely ready so that whenever the uh, NCLT order comes, then the process can be started immediately. To my understanding, it might even take uh, uh, 240 days uh, right from the day it is started. However, it will take only 120 days from the day, uh, you see, from the day NCLT order comes. Uh, or from the day the, the thinking process starts. So the total 240 days, uh, 90 days uh, is, is basically a pre-period and 90 days is the post-period. In between, I have taken about 50 days for uh, different, uh, like for NCLT. That was uh, not considered as the timeline for the IRP. But for NCLT, it's a time-consuming thing. So for a promoter, it is very difficult, very, very important to understand that uh, it will be uh, the total time would be about 240 days. So when this PIRP starts, uh, then the company would be under moratorium. When the NCL NCLT order comes, the company will be under moratorium. And uh, moratorium means that the company will be protected from suits or recovery or proceedings. Uh, these uh, moratorium period, there will not be any person, neither the company can also not transfer the assets or any rights in the company to anyone. So all these are moratorium, which is uh, normally known for the last four and five years of insolvency. Duties, I've already said that the duties of the RP would be again to uh, uh, take the list of creditors from the corporate debtor, communicate with each creditor, seek their confirmation. If not, confirmation is not sought. In, in case the confirmation is not given, then based on the, uh, based on the uh, books of account of the company, the RP will verify the claims and RP will again upload this list. The uh, committee of creditor is constituted the RP will appoint the, forens uh, the auditors, forensic auditors, valuers, and in case there is any other professional is required to be appointed like the lawyer, that also would be done by the um, RP. So the duties are just akin to uh, what the duties were in CIRP. Those are all. The powers are also the same. The, see, the powers of the um, IRP is uh, to look into the books of account, uh, operations, only supervise, not take control. Uh, he can even uh, ask uh, other departments for information. He can collect information. The promoters are supposed to reply to the RP. So these are the powers of the uh, RP during PIRP. So I think the, all this is uh, well known, like the RP is having power almost equivalent to board of directors. So he can order anything 
if it is ethically uh, uh, okay. So uh, the what is the difference between CIRP and PIRP that we have already touched base. Uh, the claims in this case is not supposed to be invited from the public at large. The list of creditor will be provided by the company to RP. RP will communicate with each creditor and in case no confirmation is received, it will keep noting. Uh, so the creditors uh, individual inviting every creditor for claim that is not provided in the PIRP. What is provided is the list will be provided by the company. The list would be uh, verified by the RP and it is actually not using the uh, verified word. They are using the word of confirming. The based on the books of account and based on the third party uh, confirmation, it is considered that the RP will confirm the claims. So once the RP confirms the plain claims, that actually becomes the complaints for uh, the purpose of settlement in the resolution plan. So the list of claims that I have discussed, committee of creditors has got the similar powers as under CIRP or under uh, PIRP, they would have the commercial wisdom power uh, they would the coc would be constituted based on the first list of claims uh, the uh, the coc would also be informed regularly that how many claims have come uh, the first meeting of the coc would be held within 7 days of the uh, date of uh, uh, 7 day, uh, days from the date of commence, uh, constitution of coc uh, cd See, the related parties would not be uh, the form of a committee of creditors. Any related party would not be a part of committee of creditors. They are not permitted in the COC. Uh, the RP will also appoint authorized representative. Uh, authorized representative in case any one class of creditors has got more than 10 members, then they can even come th to the meeting through a uh, through an authorized representative. So committee of creditor has all the powers uh, as it used to be having under the CIRP. Uh, the authorized representative concept, as I said that uh, the when there are a class of creditors, debentures, uh, uh, shareholders, uh, the, the unsecured loans, public deposit, or for that matter, any kind of class, maybe home buyers. So in case any class is having more than 10 individual uh, creditors, then they can come through an authorized representative rather than inviting everyone. But that's a mandatory obligation on the RP that in case a class has got more, then uh, the authorized representative has to be appointed. Now, uh, the base resolution plan is available base resolution plan is available uh, with the I, I believe uh, uh, the see when the base resolution plan is available then the financial creditors financial creditors will consider the base resolution plan the financial creditors will also negotiate with the promoters that we need modification we need that you upgrade we don't want to take any any haircut or we want to take less haircut this proposal is not matching with your liquidation value the liquidation value is much higher so all these negotiations will continuously keep on going along with the promoters and the financial creditors so once the promoters offer the final base resolution plan uh, during the pirp then only the financial creditors the committee of creditors will take a decision whether they would like to go for inviting resolution plans from public at large or not. So this depends upon two legal factors. One legal factor is that in case there is no haircut proposed to any operational creditor, then the base resolution plan can be accepted by the financial creditors. 
and then there is no need to invite resolution plans from public at large. But in case there is a haircut proposed for operational creditors, there is a haircut for government liabilities, statutory liabilities, or the companies asking for all the waivers, then the creditors cannot approve the base resolution plan without inviting the resolution plans from public at large. Now, this is a decision which the COC will take after concluding that this is the base resolution plan. At this moment, the financial creditors will negotiate with the promoters. The financial creditors will tell the promoter that you give us the uh, best resolution plan. Uh, so how do we, how do we make sure that the promoters are giving the best resolution plan? So in this case, uh, the concept of significantly better resolution plan was introduced. Now, what is significantly better resolution plan? The committee of creditor is asking uh, the promoter that you give us the best resolution plan. Otherwise, in case we receive a resolution plan from public, which is significantly better than your resolution plan, then we will not give you any right to improve. So this is a threat to the promoters that you offer us the best value for the company. Otherwise, we will not give you any right to modify or better your, your offer. So we will accept the resolution plan of a party from the public and we will not give you any opportunity. Otherwise, the law provides that the promoters will get opportunity every time any other person gives an offer to the bank. So the promoter will get an opportunity to better their offer. So this all system will be based on a matrix, evaluation matrix, which will be decided by the committee of creditors along with the, along with the RP based on the preference, based on the business, based on the various other factors. So there will be a scoring system. Now in that scoring system, the committee of creditors may say that if a resolution plan comes from the public and the score achieved by that resolution plan is 50% higher than your score, then you will lose your right to modify and upgrade your offer then you will lose your right to take away the company. The company will be given to the other person. So this particular concept is called significantly better resolution plan. So I would actually try to say that now the resolution plans are invited. The bid evaluation matrix is made based on the bid evaluation matrix. The resolution plans have actually come from the public. There is a possibility that three or four resolution plan comes from the public at large. And every resolution plan would be examined on that evaluation matrix. And that evaluation matrix, and that evaluation matrix would be uh, based on some scoring system. And then the COC will negotiate with all the resolution applicants. And finally, the uh, out of these resolution plans which are received from public, finally the best resolution plan would be. assessed. Now, once the best resolution plan is assessed based on the scoring system, so let me now repeat. First is a base resolution plan, which is submitted by the promoters. COC has uh, negotiated and modified the resolution plan. So the whatever resolution plan is presently available with the committee to consider that is a base resolution plan after negotiation. This is one part. Second is that there is a concept of significantly better resolution plan. Significantly better resolution plan is based on a parameters decided by the committee of creditors. And in case any resolution plan, which is submitted by the public at large, if that resolution plan, if, if any resolution plan is there, which is significantly better resolution plan, 
then the promoters would lo uh, lose their rights and the significantly better resolution plan will win and the significantly better resolution plan would be approved and the business will be taken away by that person. Now, the scenario is that in case, in case there is no significantly better resolution plan and there are three or four resolution plans from the public and based on the examination evaluation matrix, uh, there is a one resolution plan which is the best of all these resolution plans. So there is one resolution plan, which is best of all these resolution plans. So that resolution plan is called best resolution plan. So since there is no significantly better resolution plan, so there are two resolution plans available now. One is the base resolution plan from the promoters and the one is the base, best resolution plan. Now this base resolution plan and the best resolution plan will compete on a platform, whatever you call it, maybe Swiss challenge platform, technology based and both will actually compete with each other on different terms maybe on uh, total amount offered maybe on total uh, rebate asked for maybe total haircut maybe total uh, uh, the, the period of the total resolution so all this will be based on the <clears throat> technology and both will get an opportunity to improve one after one one after one it will be kind of a bidding system it will be kind of a, a auction system so if the technology would not be available, it will be based on an Excel system. So when we do this, and finally, whosoever will win the resolution plan, whosoever would offer the best of the committee of creditors, that resolution plan will be put to vote. And even after that, uh, the committee of creditors can say yes or no. In case the committee of creditors can say yes, then the resolution plan will be submitted to, uh, then this resolution plan will be submitted to NCLT for approval. So I believe uh, 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 like this is uh, something that we have uh, uh, the, see in between uh, uh, in between once the invitation of resolution plan is there invitation I've covered. So in between in case the committee see a kind of uh, uh, that the business of the company is being conducted in a fraudulent manner or there is a gross mismanagement in the company then the COC can decide that the business of the company be taken over by the RP. And the application will be made to NCLT and that application will be approved by NCLT and the entire business <clears throat> will be taken over by the uh, by, by RP. While the resolution plans are being examined and it is all being done, now the business also is being carried out by the RP. So this is uh, another concept of vesting of uh, the management with the CD. Uh, so. Uh, there's a question which everyone keeps asking uh, because once we say that the, if the PIRP fails, if the resolution plans are not approved, the company will not be liquidated and it will be, uh, it will be run by the promoters the way it was being run. But still there are reasons for liquidation in this uh, framework, in this part of the law. So there is only one situation where the company will be liquidated and that situation is what you can see on my screen like section 54J in case the management is vested with the RP based on the fraudulent and gross mismanagement of the promoters then in after doing this in case no resolution plan is approved after doing this if no resolution plan is approved then the company will not go back to the same promoters who are actually doing it fraudulently then the company would be liquidated. Then the company would be liquidated. So this is the, uh, the vesting of the management uh, uh, with the RP. Uh, so now there are two new sections which are also introduced in this law. And one is for uh, 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 no officer of the company manages the affair with the intent to defraud the creditors. And there is a penalty of about one crore. And then the uh, RP shall file an application to uh, adjudicating authority for this penalty. <clears throat> so once the resolution plan is approved, uh, there are concept of operational creditors protection and the dissenting creditors, that concepts are all, all there. So the resolution plans that are approved, it is binding. Uh, so uh, this base resolution plan, significantly best, better resolution plan, best resolution plan I've already done. So the resolution plan is approved and uh, the company is uh, now uh, maybe it survives and any creditor 
who is not filed their claim or who was not there in the list any creditor who could not get anything under the resolution plan they also would not get anything and the company will be completely protected from the past liabilities including statutory liabilities including gst including the uh, any other income tax liability also so the when the approval is is done after the approval uh, appeal is also possible like in between in between in case the com committee of creditors decide that the pirp is not uh, functioning we can terminate it so in case the pirp is terminated the company is being run by the promoter so no negative impact there is no negative impact of termination or failure of the pirp and everything will continue to be the same maybe other options would be tried later on once the pirp fails so the other options can be uh, tried so then then there are like uh, in fact valuation is required in this case two valuers would be appointed and the valuers will value the assets owned by the company valuers are not supposed to value unless the banks separately can get it done for their own consumption but they are not supposed to value the assets which are owned by persons other than the company and is also uh, mortgaged to the bank so there are various forms that has been introduced in this case the p1 to p14 so this part is the last part i before taking up this part i would actually uh, seek any questions in case there are any then thereafter i will do this part and then uh, i will close the session today uh, sir there is just one question there is one apprehension by somebody that uh, you know in case the promoters provide the best possible resolution plan to the financial creditor so in that case also can he be taken for a ride in that case also you know are there possibilities that the financial creditor can still go on a fishing expedition and look for a, a you know proposal from somebody else uh, yes uh, e, like even in the case even in the case when a resolution plan is offered by the promoters and there is no haircut which is being offered to operational creditors most of the haircut is only to financial creditor the financial creditor may or may not accept they still may go fishing for a new resolution plan or a best resolution plan in the market to understand the market conditions to understand the value which can be uh, given to this company it is also required for justification uh, because the financial creditors probably would check this that we have seen the market so there was nobody other than the promoters who were ready to take over the company so uh, therefore we had agreed to this uh, resolution plan and so just one last question uh, you know in case there is a there is a promoter who wants to on his own get in somebody else also as a partner in the business because he does not have adequate resources to pay off the financial creditors uh, so is there a possibility of him on his own getting a shareholder in the company and uh, you know then going uh, forward with the proposal so that's the best resolution plan that is the objective of this uh, pirp structure pre packaged pre packaged means that if there is there has to be somebody else who will come and manage the company and if the promoter brings that person that i am selling my company to this person and he will be the person who would be controlling the business from now however he needs these waiver 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 that is the hmm. basis the, the basic name of this pre packaged insolvency resolution plan is suggest that the resolution is also available with the promoters but they just want to come to the nclt and committee of creditors to convince them so that is the hmm. actual name which suggests so that he can bring right. an investor he can bring a person who want to buy the business altogether so that the person who is buying the business should not be confronted with multiple liabilities or non compliance of the past right sir these were the two questions so i think this part that i am discussing this is general uh, part it is not something which is provided in the law it is not something which is provided in the regulation it is based on my experience and uh, it is based on the various questions that people have been asking me since the time this pirp structure has been uh, notified so the first part is like the apprehensions to lenders the creditors will have many apprehensions i will just take up one by one uh, the first apprehension is uh, the why the lenders lenders means the 
the banks would allow the CD to start PIRP. So I've said I, uh, in response to one question uh, which you asked uh, in the beginning, uh, one, the creditors definitely would be interested that the financial stress should be resolved because they would like to avoid CIRP or they would like to avoid liquidation or surface action. Because of there are more provisioning requirements are there under the other uh, modes, there is no provisioning requirement under PIRP. Uh, so therefore, yeah, the, so therefore the uh, therefore the financial uh, creditor, what? therefore the financial creditor definitely would uh, like to avoid a scenario where they are supposed to make more provisions. So they would like to uh, resolve the financial stress. Uh, in uh, When the PIRP starts, banks are not required to make any provision. However, after the PIRP resolution plan is approved by the NCLT, and if there are restructured, if they have allowed some restructuring, as per the RBI circular, the provisions are supposed to be created. So this process is a kind of mutual and judicial process. The, it is a committee-based approach. The bankers would not hesitate in taking decisions as against the OTS or as against the restructuring, because this is a committee-based decision. Everything will be happening in a transparent manner. So the banks will be more keen to do this restructuring in this manner rather than normal restructuring and OTS. There are, there are requirements that the company will provide full information about the company, its financial uh, strength, its business strength. That otherwise will be very, very helpful for the banks to understand the company. Even if they don't approve the resolution plan, they would like to go for PIRP. So if the, if the company would not uh, cooperate, they would say, okay, get the forensic audit done. Then we will only go for the PIRP. So in this uh, PIRP, the banks are not supposed to bear any cost. The company will bear the cost. Whereas in the CIRP, the banks are contributing to the cost. So now the banks would be more interested in PIRP rather than CIRP. In fact, today morning, uh, I, I got a phone call from one of the bankers that we want to start a case. <clears throat> they were looking for a, uh, they were looking for a RP in my company. So I said, that, uh, this is a case which is most suitable for PIRP. So now the bank is uh, uh, would be discussing after uh, this uh, this session. The bank senior people would be discussing with me how the PIRP would be beneficial as against CIRP that we thought earlier. So I will actually tell them all these benefits that I am now uh, discussing with you. So uh, the uh, they see even if the banks give an in principle approval for PIRP, that doesn't mean that they they have accepted the resolution plan that they may uh, reject later on. That's not something which is difficult. So the other apprehension of the lenders was that most of the promoters, they don't offer anything. They try to start from rupees one in case they feel that the value of the company is rupees 10. Therefore, I explained to them that the concept of significantly better resolution plan that actually will defy this apprehension this apprehension actually would be totally met. The promoters definitely would try to offer the best they can. Secondly, there will be valuation by two registered valuers. The, R the RP can also invite resolution plans from public and there can be a very, very healthy competition between the promoters and public at large. So this uh, apprehension is also not really well kept. Then if the promoters are in possession and control, so they may indulge in diversion or other avoidance transactions. While the PIRP is going on, the promoters may continue with their uh, diversion of funds or, or indulgence into avoidance transaction. So there are many provisions to control this part. RP, in any case, is supervising the operations of the corporate data. The COC can even limit the powers of the board of directors in the very first meeting that such transactions would not be done by the board of directors without their prior approval. There can be a regular MIS system on place. And in case the apprehensions are there that the, the corporate data is still doing some transaction, then the COC can decide that the RP will take control. 
and if still found uh, difficult to control, then the COC can even convert PIRP into CIRP. And then 67A is there where the penalty is proposed up to one crore. Section 77A is also there, which actually provides imprisonment for uh, three to five years. So these are the apprehension. Then the, then the other says, the, the other apprehension where the creditors ask me question, the, the promoters are in possession and control. <clears throat> they may indulge in diversion. So then I said that the COC in the very first meeting can decide that these are the transactions which would not be done by the board of directors. As I said, the sale of fixed asset, repayment of any secured or unsecured loans or providing any loan to or any uh, other loan. Related party transactions would, they would, be, would require condition uh, the approval of committee of creditors. Any business trans transactions beyond a threshold limit that also can be uh, mentioned in the first resolution. Any decision regarding capital restructuring, board of directors, shareholding, key managerial personnel, constitution, all this can be brought to the all this can be brought to the lenders so that they are comfortable while the management of the companies with the promoters. Now the other apprehension of the banks is that if the resolution plan other than base resolution plan is approved by the COC, how to control and preserve the assets. This is a valid apprehension because if a resolution plan is approved, uh, which is not base resolution plan, then the promoters are under control of the business. They understand that the NCLT will approve somebody else to take over the company. Then why should they leave anything in the company? Then why should they leave anything in the company? So in that case, uh, the following remedies can be taken. One, the security guards immediately can be deputed by the RP or by the COC. Further limits can be imposed on the transactions by the company in the bank account. The COC can decide to take over the control and custody as, as, as in CIRP by making an application to adjudicating authority. RP can be asked to be more vigilant on the operations of the company. The successful resolution applicant can also be asked to, to depute their own person to look after the uh, business and assets of the company. Of course, section 67A and section 77A is also important. See, overall, why this PIRP should be opted? Why the PIRP should be opted? One, that the business would continue to be managed by the board of directors as usual. In case the PIRP fails, no resolution plan is approved. The company continues to operate by the promoters and they may find alternatives for resolving their financial stress. If PIRP will not be filed, then somebody else will file the insolvency of the company or the bankers will start taking surface action. The cost of the PIRP is also lesser. And the most important for the company, for the promoters is that there is no stigma of the uh, CIRP. There is no stigma of insolvency. The PIRP is considered to be a restructuring and it is not supposed to be informed to the public at large. The promoters are sitting on the same chair as they were sitting. They are still signing the checks. There is no disruption in the business. There is no impact in the market credibility. The business is continuing as it was continuing earlier while the proposal is going on with the banks. Uh, in case you have to induct a partner, you have to induct a uh, uh, investor, then you have to crystallize the liabilities. Nobody would come and uh, uh, with uncertain liabilities. So therefore the uh, all this induction of partner, sale of business, for crystallization of the liabilities, for crystallization of the past liabilities, for crystallization of the past criminal liabilities, <clears throat> the business will continue. Everything will actually be left behind to the existing to earlier promoters. That is what is PIRP. See this, all the business can, it's like the sale of business transactions also can be routed through PIRP. See like one time settlement, like in case there is an option available with any board of directors that they should do for one time settlement, they have some asset, there is a customer approaching us and we can sell this asset and we can do some one time settlement. So one time settlement is something which the banks are not doing, then they can approach the banks through PIRP. And like see, while the PIRP is continuing, uh, the even the company is protected under the moratorium. The company is also protected that no, no other insolvency process will start. The company is also protected from surface actions. So the, uh, the CD will be totally protected. 
So the based on the liquidation value, the liabilities also would be waived. If the liquidation value of the company is 50 and the liabilities are 200, then 150 crores of the liabilities would be waived under section 53 of the insolvency law. So this is a much better platform where we actually would like to dilute the shareholding of the promoters and add business partners. No, like see, think of a company which is a beta positive. The business can be run, the business can be serviced, the, the, the debt can be serviced. However, the only difficulty is the existing huge burden of debt or the past non-compliances or the notices from the income tax department or the size department or the GST department. So all these are the issues which is actually hurdle to continue the business. Now all these can be freezed and the business can be continued. I have seen many businesses where the people are shifting from one company to the other company and then from the other company to the other company because see, they are not able to manage the existing stress of the company. So they are opening new companies in the name of their relatives. That was the time when you could have trusted more in your relatives. Now there is no time to trust more on the relatives. So you actually have to do the business in your own name. So this is the way that you can continue to do your own business in your own name. So there are various contingent liabilities which are, a, which are a very big threat on the company. Like maybe that there is a raid on the company and there is, you are expecting a total demand of 100 crores which is coming from all these departments. So when the demand will come, they will seize your account, they will attach your asset when at that time you would start. I think you should start much early. You should start much early through the PIRP process. You can say that, yes, uh, I, I can add an investor. <clears throat> I can add some person from uh, uh, others uh, from the market who actually will take some percentage of my company and <clears throat> uh, the company's liabilities would be crystallized. So now the investors also would be available for MSME business. Now the shareholders also would be available for the MSME business. So they would actually come and really take participate into the business. So this is what I wanted to say that this structure is much, much better for various eventualities of the uh, business uh, stress. We would take up some questions and if there is uh, some, I think we can see it. Uh, you can see it on the Facebook also probably. Uh, Abhishek sir, you are on mute. Uh, sir, uh, currently there are no questions on Facebook. Right, right. So maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, conclude in some time. So I think uh, I have concluded in this manner that this uh, PIRP structure is the best uh, framework for handling any uh, financial stress of MSME. Also for handling any transaction of uh, inducting a partner selling the business to someone, uh, getting an investor. So this is the best structure. Or anything that you want to do as an OTS should be done through PIRP. So with that, actually, I, I thank uh, 40 as an organization. I thank uh, uh, the president of 40, Mr. Suresh Agarwal. I also thank Aditi Khandelwal and uh, my partner Abhishek uh, Mishra. Uh, who is uh, available in Jaipur for any kind of uh, further questions on this uh, uh, PIRP framework. Abhishek Sharmaji, again, thank you very much. And over to um, Abhishek Mishraji. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I mean, uh, it always was, was informative. And whenever I'm moderating the session, my own knowledge about PIRP and IBC as a whole increases. So I'll uh, pass on the baton to Aditi to say a few words in the end has been coordinating from Bombay. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. It was really knowledgeable. Sabko, I'm sure ki jitne bhi listeners hume sun rahe the, and because this is going to be there on our Facebook page. So, aake bhi, jab bhi kisi ko thodi si koi problem aayegi is baare mein ya koi janna chahega, to it's going to be a very, very informative session for everybody. Uh, thank you, Anil Goyal sir. Thank you, Abhishek Mishra ji. And uh, now I invite Abhishek Sharma ji for a formal vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Aditi ji. It was really a wonderful session and due to some internet issue, I'm not able to show my video because some net connectivity issue is there. So I'm thankful to respect Anil Goel sir, see Anil Goel sir from Delhi and uh, see Abhishek Misha sir from our own city, Jaipur. And of course to you, Aditi ji, uh, you have traveled all the way from Jaipur to Mumbai and even 
during this traveling, you are managing session. So it's really wonderful. It was really wonderful session, and it was really informative. And I was just going through the presentation of uh, Anil sir and found it. It's it's being lot of knowledgeable. And once you go through the presentation of the sir, then you, you need not to read any further book to understand the procedure part particularly uh, for this insolvency packages and all. So I'm thankful to you, Anil sir. Thankful to Abhishek Mishra sir for being with us, for being with Forty for this program. And thankful to Dr. Aditi also for organizing this wonderful program. Thank you. Over to you, Aditi ji. Okay. Thank you. Okay. On that Thank note, okay. On that note. I uh, would like to again say thank you from my side uh, to Anil sir, Abhishek Mishra ji, Abhishek Sharma ji, and Suresh ji Agarwal for giving me this opportunity to organize the whole thing. And I'm sure आगे भी हम लोग को आपके साथ में कर और भी sessions करने के मौके मिलते रहेंगे Anil sir. Certainly, uh, it will be my pleasure also, and uh, I I believe that the audience. Uh, definitely should get some gains out of it i am not sure whether the recording would be available on facebook or somewhere else but i think the it, i, I it would, would also be there, promote sir. the i would also promote the recording of this by circulating to those who uh, need it uh, thank you very much all for uh, organizing this uh, uh, webinar thanks a lot so just want to share one more thing that uh, this is live on the facebook page it will remain there only and apart from that we will prepare a video of this and by today evening or tomorrow morning we'll circulate the video also to our members to view in case they were not able to see it live and we'll also share the video to you so that you can also uh, refer to the person to whom you want to refer sir. thank you thank you thank you okay. thank you abhishek thank you everybody thank you, thank you all the participants thanks okay